Hello everyone, welcome back. Thanks for watching. Just a quick couple of comments on the recent hijab and wood debate. Um, as most of you know, I'm kind of an Old Testament nerd. I spend a lot of time there, and Muslims are ignorant of the divine plurality language that's in the Old Testament, and they're ignorant of the divine plurality component of Jewish theology that was present a very long time before it could, became a catalyst for uh, Jews to convert to Christianity and was declared a heresy. So these are kind of black hole areas for Muslims. They don't know divine plurality language in the Old Testament, and they don't know that divine plurality was a big part of Jewish theology, two big um, gaps in their knowledge. And so when you bring up this kind of stuff, they're just completely taken by surprise um, because they haven't taken their time to um, to familiarize themselves with it. So David Wood actually brought a couple of these components up. He brought up some verses in the Old Testament. He also brought up the uh, the two powers theology. He didn't refer to it as that, but he referred to a scholar who has published some work on that. Um, and Hijab just had no idea how to respond to this, um, which is expected. I was hoping he would actually attempt to interact with the text that David Wood presented, but Hijab spent very little time actually engaging with what would said, unfortunately. I wanted to see him engage more with the text. He only engaged briefly with just uh, a handful of things uh, that David Wood mentioned in his uh, opening statement and again a couple of times in his rebuttal. So I wanted to go over just a couple of those and uh, we'll start with um, Hijab's comment regarding the I am statements that Jesus makes, which of course has uh, some Old Testament background. So let's check this out. <laughs> Beatboxing? <laughs> Technical difficulties, let me try the other clip. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll get it right this time. What else did he say? I am statement. If you look at the New International Version of the Bible, uh, the I am is actually not translated as I am, but I will be. And there's a whole discussion on that. All right, so notice in the NIV, it's translated, I will be. Well, let's, let's listen to that again. The I am is actually not translated as I am, but I will be. I will be. That's interesting. So, so the, the I will be statement couldn't be related to the I am statement because one is I will be and the other is I am. Now, here's a question. If you, like Muhammad Hijab, um, did constantly criticize your opponent for not knowing Hebrew, what should you know? Any guesses? Hebrew. That's right. And if you knew Hebrew, when you actually looked at the statements in Exodus chapter 3, here's what you would see. Let's cut to my screen. All right, here's the I am statement. I have it highlighted here. I am who I am. Here it is in Hebrew. Eheye, asher, eheye. Now this form right here, this is the Cal Imperfect 1CS. It's, it's late at night, I know. Cal Imperfect 1CS uh, form of the verb Haya, which means to be, okay? It's imperfect. So it could just as easily be translated, I will be. I will be. I've heard that phrase before. The I am is actually not translated as I am, but I will be. Where have I heard that phrase? I will be. I will be. I will be. So the Hebrew can easily be translated, I will be, in the I am statements. Don't believe me? No problem. Let's check a couple commentaries. Here's the Tyndale Old Testament commentary, I am who I am, Hebrew, aheye, asher, aheye, possibly, I will be what I will be, so it reflects that future tense. Let's jump to another commentary, you know I love because of Islamic anti-Semitism to quote Jewish scholars, so let's jump to Nahum Sarna. Sarna says, the phrase has variously been translated, I am that I am, I am who I am, and I will be what I will be. So you can see that Hijab's choice of the NIV translation, I will be, and he's choosing that argument as a defeater for the I am statements of the Old Testament. Actually, the Hebrew can easily be translated that way and has been translated that way. But you don't even have to rely on the translations. You just read the Hebrew, right? Which is what Hijab constantly advised David Wood to do. However, if Hijab would have read the Hebrew in Exodus 3 prior to this debate, if he can indeed even read Hebrew, then he would not have made such a stupid statement. His statement actually destroyed his argument about the I am slash I will be statements that Jesus made. But that's really not the main point. Let's get to his Zechariah 6 argument. Spirit of God hovered over the, uh, hovered over after the God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, no problem. If, if that's meant to be God, no problem. Let's go to Zechariah's 
in Old Testament, chapter 6, verse 5, there are four spirits. So are there seven gods now? So the background here is David Wood mentioned Genesis 1. It's one of his texts from the Old Testament with divine plurality language. And this is the text where the Spirit of God is hovering over the water. So what a job did is said, Spirit, and then in order to make his argument seem uh, more formidable, he used the Hebrew word, ruach. Because if you know the Hebrew word, that means you know how to exegete Hebrew. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. So he takes spirit in Zechariah 6.5. There are four of them, right? Four spirits in Zechariah 6.5. The one that David mentioned from Genesis 1. And then the Father and the Son. Now you have seven members in the Trinity, right? It's actually the Trinity plus four. Trinity 4.0. There's a problem with this. Let's take a look at the Hebrew, okay? Okay, this is such nonsense, we don't actually have to look at the Hebrew, but let's go ahead and do it. Spirit of God, there's Spirit of God right there in Genesis 1. Here we have Rach Elohim, all right? And this is a conjunction, so, and Rach Elohim, and this talks about uh, hovering or floating over the face of the water. Okay, so there's Genesis 1. Let's, let's just remember this phrase, very simple phrase, Spirit of God. Okay, everybody got that? Good, let's move to the passage that um, Hijab quoted in Zechariah. Zechariah 6, 5. Um, the four winds of heaven, now it's the same word here, winds, spirit, we can, you know, hijab is saying spirit, that, that's fine, let's go with spirit. Um, four spirits of heaven, and then you have the phrase over here, this is the Hebrew for four, and then you have the plural form of ruach, and then you have hashemayim, which means heavens, okay? Did you catch that? Genesis 1 Spirit of God, Zechariah 6, 5, spirits of heaven. That's different. But if hijab can take spirits of heaven in Zechariah 6 and just erase of heaven and put in its place of God and then add those four spirits of God to the one spirit in Genesis 1, plus the Father and the Son, and come up with seven, if you can just take the word spirit and just rip it out of context and apply it to whomever you want, like Hijab did, then that means we can do this with the Quran. We'll just go through the Quran, look for the word spirit, and then put of Allah at the end of it and see what we come up with. Let's check this out. We have indeed decked the lower heaven with beauty, in the stars, and for a guard against all obstinate, rebellious, evil spirits of Allah. But we do think that no man or spirit of Allah should say aught that is untrue against Allah. Now, how can a spirit of Allah say something untrue against Allah? I have no idea. Now, when you get into the Hadith, it actually gets kind of weird. There's Aisha, and she brings these clothes. She swore by Allah that the Spirit of Allah was taken in these two clothes. And here we read about the apparent death of the Spirit of Allah. Or maybe it's just bad exegesis to take a word and put whatever words you want on the end of it and then use that in your argument. Maybe, that, maybe you just shouldn't do that. Maybe you just can't take spirits of the heavens in Zechariah 6, and say that that actually means spirits of God, it's an ontological statement, and then you attach that to Genesis 1. I mean, this is a bunch of nonsense. Show me a Muslim who's trying to tell me what the Bible says, and I'll show you a Muslim who doesn't know what he's talking about. Show me a Muslim who tells me what the Bible says, and I'll show you a Muslim who will quote the NIV translation of Jesus' I am statements and not realize that it corresponds perfectly to the Hebrew in Exodus 3 and defeats his own argument while at the same time he's criticizing his opponent for not knowing Hebrew. I mean, how ignorant is this? And this is why I can't do a reaction video. It would just be too long. It would be too much. But these are just a couple samples Ignorance and arrogance of Muslims. It, there's no wonder that Muhammad acted or interacted uh, so infrequently and so superficially with the texts that uh, David Wood cited. Muslims are not equipped to deal with divine plurality texts in the Old Testament. They're not equipped to deal with the fact that this was a key component in Jewish theology for a very long time. Right? Th these are black holes. Like I said before, they're black holes of information. They just, they just can't see what's there, and so they're taken completely by surprise, and they have no idea how to deal with it. And so they go into these nonsense arguments, and you've seen one of them here, 
with Zechariah 6, 5. Absolute nonsense. So that's all for this video. Just uh, two points on the recent debate, and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll see you for the next video. Thanks for watching.